The race to Laugh Tale is heating up because the recent chapter showed us another Yonko officially punching in his ticket to join the chase for the One Piece with Buggy declaring his desire to become the Pirate King. Luffy, Shanks, Blackbeard and now Buggy are all after the same goal and the road to witnessing this highly anticipated clash of styles and personalities begins. We also learn that Cross Guild's notoriety is increasing with the bounty system they placed on the Marines resulting in the death of a beloved Vice Admiral. But the biggest reveal was that Sabo is alive and that he's back in the picture and with him is a big story too dangerous to tell. And in this video, we're going to dive deeper into all these new events that are guaranteed to have massive implications for the future of the story. The chapter begins in a shocking way, announcing the death of Vice Admiral T-Bone and it's even more shocking to find out who was responsible. We see Sengoku and Suru discussing his death and find out that one of the very same civilians they swore to protect is the culprit. An old man from Pepe Kingdom where every year over a thousand people die of starvation. And this is an important detail surrounding the death of T-Bone because of what we know of him. He was portrayed to us as one of the good marines who will do anything and sacrifice everything for his subordinates. We saw this when he was first introduced back in Water 7. T-Bone had an overdramatic approach when it came to showing his kindness which contrasts his scary appearance. He has a hobby of saving people and a motto of a hundred good deeds per day. It's also worth noting that the man who supposedly killed T-Bone seems feeble and someone not used to violence, only acting out for the sake of providing for his starving family. The man just doesn't scream fighter, let alone someone who could beat T-Bone who was shown capable of cutting a sea king in half. So all these details put together makes T-Bone's death somewhat suspicious. And if we were to speculate on the reality of it, we can assume that T-Bone's death played out in an overdramatic way. Say, maybe T-Bone went to to Pepe Kingdom and saw the people starving and as part of his 100 good deeds per day, told the people to kill him and claim the bounty on his head to feed the culprit's family. Or it could even be a setup to another classic One Piece joke, where the man did actually try to kill T-Bone, but whatever the man did wasn't enough and T-Bone actually survived, but is now thought to be dead because... Well, he does look like he is. Yo -ho -ho. And as ridiculous as that sounds, you never really know what to expect with this series because a silly turn of events like that sounds like it's right up Oda's alley. But this is also the thing I love about One Piece. Here we have a very minor character who was given an obvious personality quirk and a dedicated moment to showcase his ability. Even if he's not a significant character in the grand scheme of things, we still feel the impact of his supposed death because of our familiarity with him and the way we were geared towards liking this scary yet adorable man as opposed to just using a random throwaway character to move the plot forward. By the way, I just want to acknowledge how Sengoku seems to be more relaxed now that he's not a fleet admiral. Seeing him ask for Garp not to scold him but just to have him try a new rice cracker flavor is so adorable. But of course, Garp continues to be a headache for him even after no longer being his subordinate. Also, I wonder if he and Suru will take action and also become a part of the upcoming story Story, since Suru's niece might be in danger as well now. And of course, barring any flashbacks, it opens a way for these two legends to showcase their abilities, or what's left of it. While there may be some uncertainty surrounding T-Bone's death, the news of it guarantees one thing, and that is the ever-increasing threat of Cross Guild, who are becoming one of the Marines' biggest headaches. Tapping into people's desire for wealth increases the seriousness and danger that this faction poses to the world government, who are now faced with the difficult conflict of how to protect themselves against the people they swore to protect and serve. And it's scary to think that Cross Guild is just barely scratching the surface because we also learn that Crocodile and Mihawk are planning to increase their influence to an unparalleled level to form their utopia and become a military state. But the most intriguing part is their plan to build such overwhelming power. Cross Guild's plan is working, but they still need to increase their military forces. And this could suggest that they're going to recruit other forces from all over the place. So don't be surprised if you see the return of a familiar face or two to join this faction. And I could throw in as many notable names in there as I want, but why don't I leave that up to you? Leave a comment below on who you would like to see eventually join Cross Guild. Maybe we can turn that into a video. 
Now onto my favorite everything about this chapter, the man himself, Buggy D. Clown. As with every other time we see Buggy, his appearance in this chapter is filled with comedy. We learn that Buggy took responsibility for building the Cross Guild ship, but his shipwrights overdid it with Buggy-centric features, angering both Crocodile and Mihawk. We also get a look at Cross Guild's meeting room, but after having a closer look inside, it seems to act more of a torture room for Buggy. And I'm not even sure if he's welcome in this room outside of his punishment, because apart from the ones that Crocodile and Mihawk are sitting on, the only other chair available is a spiky iron chair. It's also a cute detail that the island where Buggy is staying is fittingly named Empty Bluffs. But in this case, Buggy showed more than just false bravado. He showed real guts. As of right now, out of the three of them, Buggy is the one who is showing the most pirate-like qualities. Crocodile and Mihawk's approach is that of businessmen, calculatively considering risks and opportunities, whereas Buggy is the one fearlessly going for the big prize. Buggy now confirmed to also have the dream of becoming the Pirate King. In revealing this, the chapter also extended the scene from chapter 434, which showed Buggy refusing Shanks' request to join his crew. We learned that Buggy always believed in Shanks and was even willing to support Shanks, helping him achieve this goal of becoming the Pirate King of their generation. And it's a real shock to find out that the actual cause of their now distant relationship is because Buggy was disappointed that Shanks changed his mind about going after the One Piece. From his point of view, it seemed like Shanks was giving up and not following their beloved captain's footsteps, which raises further intrigue about what Shanks has really been up to. If he wasn't ready then, why is he ready now? It begs the question of whether his final conversation with Roger had something to do with his decision to postpone his chase for the One Piece, or whether it's something else, such as it simply being Shanks' way of remembering his captain, ensuring Roger's name lives on a little longer as the Pirate King instead of quickly being replaced by a new king. This reveal also provides an interesting what-if scenario as to what Shanks would have been able to achieve compared to Luffy at a similar age had he been more active in his pursuit. In Buggy's case, going after Captain John's treasure might have been more of a consolation prize in his mind since he thought he couldn't compete with someone like Shanks, which led to my favorite Buggy character moment, him realizing that fate has brought him to equal footing with Shanks again and so reclaiming his dream to go after the most most important treasure to become the Pirate King. It's just such a good scene. It's a very inspiring moment to witness someone with a forgotten dream. At one of his weakest points, under threat, his head disembodied, and still an overwhelming urge to yell out his true desire. It is time for Buggy to claim the One Piece. Chills. It reminded me of the scene at Onigashima where Kaido and Big Mom declared they're going after the One Piece and their subordinates were all cheering like Buggy's crew. And ever the pirate that he is, Buggy knows the way, he knows the objective, and he finds other means within his ability to achieve it. The most hilarious part about this is that Crocodile and Mihawk are now reluctant passengers in this race. Their dynamic with Buggy was already becoming a favorite, but now we've added another layer with Buggy dragging the meticulous Crocodile and Mihawk who just want to be left alone to his fall to the top, cementing my full investment into this crew. I would honestly love nothing more than for Mihawk and Crocodile to get to that point when they actually end up genuinely liking Buggy and actively help him to get to the One Piece. It's one of those ideas that makes your nose tingle from happiness when you think about it. Honestly, seeing those two save Buggy from danger and delivering dialogue along the lines of, hey, hands off our captain. It's probably something very unlikely to happen, but boy, would that be peak. Wealth, fame, power, right? Also, speaking of things that make you happy, Luffy being mentioned in the same breath as Shanks by another powerful character like Mihawk is just plain awesome. The Yonko threat is for real. I'm giddy just thinking about their inevitable clash, because this Yonko battle royale is setting up to be the most epic clash to date. Just think of all the big names involved so far and the potential matchups we could be witnessing. You can write down names, shuffle them, pick any two up, and it's guaranteed to be a big, exciting matchup. It doesn't matter who runs into who out of these four powerhouse groups. It's a classic in the making. This chapter also just casually revealed that Sabo is alive. As we get an update on the Revolutionary Army, some members we saw back in chapter 905 have officially been introduced as the vice captains to the army commanders, and while they all seem interesting and have their own quirks, as is the standard with One Piece characters, I think we can all agree 
agree that the most notable one is Ahiru, the girl with robotic arms whose speech patterns includes making mechanical noises, adding to the list of waifus in this arc. Moda, the milk maiden who helped Ace in his cover story and was last seen in chapter 904, also made an appearance and may even find her way to prominence as she's now joining the revolutionary army along with the other people from Lulucia. Adding to the parallel that Sabo has now saved the woman who saved Ace, I love how Sabo's character has become more than just Ace's replacement. The recent events involving Sabo really turned him into one of the most crucial parts of piecing together some of the biggest mysteries. We're finally about to see what really happened at the reverie from Sabo's perspective, and the excitement I have cannot be contained. With the scenes rapidly changing from one to another, Sabo's story is one that I'm really interested in. And if I'm being honest, even more than any of the fights happening right now, just because this will be the reveal of something we've been wondering about for a long time. And even if you're someone who would rather witness a fight in a chapter, apart from the excitement in finding out answers to questions like who really assassinated King Cobra and why was it made out to be Sabo, and the more intriguing what or who did Sabo see on the empty throne, Sabo's flashback may also show how exactly the battle between the revolutionary officers against Fujitora and Ryokugu went down. So there really is just a lot to be excited about in Sabo's upcoming story. And no matter what we get in the next chapter, it is guaranteed to be exciting. Back to Egghead with the Straw Hats and Vegapunk, resuming Garp versus Kuzan, another step towards the man marked in flames, or back here where we left off, Sabo telling his story. Seriously, can you think of any other form of media that has this effect? Every week, we are getting fed hype chapter after hype chapter, and I'm here to eat up whatever One Piece is cooking. So as always, thank you for listening to another one of my rambles. Let me know your thoughts. Please do subscribe. This is Joy Girl, and I'll see you again soon.